Working with detective stories, believe it or not, they're a fairly modern invention. But the detective story here in America did not begin until 1841, when Edgar Allan Poe wrote the first detective story, Murder at the Rue Morgue, with Auguste Dupin being the first detective. And he wrote a few others, uh, one of which was The Purloined Letter. He also wrote Thou Art the Man, where he kind of expanded on the detective story theme a little bit by having the villain plant false clues to kind of throw you off. But why did the detective story only start 181 years ago? Because it was just 190 years ago that the detective showed up. Believe it or not, our modern police force originated in London in 1829. When Robert Peel started what became known as the Metropolitan Police Force. You know, Scotland Yard, uh, the Bow Street Runners, all sorts of other things. But Robert Peel was the one who realized that we needed a patrol in neighborhoods, in areas, and so he came up with his constables, his constables on patrol. That's where you have the cops. But because he was the one who started it, trained him, oversaw the whole operation, and really established it as a presence in metropolitan London, in his honor, they were called, and are still called, Bobbies for Robert Peel. Well, other big metropolitan centers like Paris, New York, Philadelphia, places like that saw, hey, this is working. It's helping reduce crime. It's helping, you know, keep people safe. They started duplicating it. Until then, your law enforcement was really a local constable, a sheriff, sometimes the local militia. It was a big problem. They'd call in the army. It was very localized, not very well trained, and not very organized. But now, with society and cities becoming very big and criminal activity becoming very organized, law enforcement had to become organized too. So once you started that in, I think it was in the 1830s that it started coming here to uh, the United States. Shortly thereafter, you're going to have the detective story, where now you have a new hero. Well, we've got to tell a story about him. People are going to be interested. So you had the murders at the Rue Morgue. You had the detective, Auguste you know, Dupin. And Edgar Allan Poe, the father of the modern horror novel, was the father of the modern detective story. Some people talk about his story, The Gold Bug, being a detective story because somebody has to go find out what happened. Yeah, because they have to go find out what happened to a particular character in there. But you never come across the evidence that points out what happened until the end. And in a detective story, you've got to have the clues or the pieces to the puzzle where people can see them. When you're putting together a puzzle... You always have the box that has a picture of what's supposed to happen. Well, in a detective story, it's the same way. A person has been murdered. A crime has been committed. Something has been done that is setting that particular setting in turmoil. If you're a good writer, you have left pieces of the puzzle for the reader to find throughout the story. They will have the premise of... Something happened to Mr. Body. They will have to figure it out. That's giving them the cover of the box to use to put together the pieces. If you're a bad writer, what you've done is you've dumped a bunch of cornflakes on the table and you set the box there and you've got a whole bunch of people trying to put together a rooster. And that's not how it works. You've got to have the three particular keynotes of a good detective or a good murder mystery. Means, motive, and opportunity. You have to have the body. You have to have the villain. You have to have suspects. There's not a lot of suspense if 
you know, it's only two people in a room, one kills the other. Pretty much guaranteed that it was the other guy. So you've got to have a whole bunch of people. Here's where things get a little creative and a little tricky, and you've got a little bit of room to play with, but also a little bit of responsibility. Was this a spur-of-the-moment crime? Was it done, you know, in the heat of passion? You know, somebody gets into an argument, somebody in a fit of jealousy, somebody's frightened, somebody's threatened, they lash out, they kill the other person. Was it premeditated? Was it a very carefully planned murder or crime or assault or whatever? If so, how the villain is going to respond to the threat of discovery is going to be totally different. If it was unplanned, spur of the moment, they're not going to have things thought out too well. They're not going to really know how to deflect attention from them. They're not going to know how to confuse the investigators. They might lie and say, oh, I didn't have anything to do with that. But the investigator, if they're any good, knows that you're probably going to say that even if you were, you know, the one who did it. So that's really not much of a deflection. If you are somebody who has been thinking this out, then you've thought of false clues or what are called red herrings. And that term actually goes back to old England once again with the fox hunting. In order to train foxhounds to stay on the scent, they would distract them with pickled herring, which if you've ever pickled herring or smoked herring or done anything with herring, it turns red. And it's still very strong, very pungent, and so they would run that across the track of a fox to distract the dogs. It's a red herring. It's something that's going to lead the investigator into another direction. Dorothy Sayers wrote one of her marathon books with her character, Lord Peter Whimsey. And it was called The Five Red Herrings. It's a very complicated murder mystery, but she tosses in five red herrings. And the thing was, at least she was honest about it in the title. And I knew that going into the book. And by God, I still fell for every single one of them. That's another thing you, you've got to contend with. You know, that's going to indicate the cleverness of your, your villain. Now, if you have an amateur sleuth, they're not necessarily going to be that much of a threat to a master criminal. Or so they would think. How many people in Agatha Christie's books never saw Miss Marple coming? She was this quiet little old lady who liked to knit, have tea, supposedly easily flustered, but over her cup of tea or over her knitting needle, she could discourse on all types of murder, adultery, all the seediest sides of human nature without turning a hair. That's the other thing you've got to take into account. How clever is your criminal going to be? But the more clever they are, the more they underestimate whoever is hunting them. They'll be expecting the police to be investigating. They will be expecting forensics labs to be investigating. They will be expecting all of the experts. So if they are a quote-unquote master criminal or a premeditated murderer or somebody who's really put a lot of thought into this, and carrying out a very involved plot, they're not going to notice the amateur detective who comes bumbling in and doesn't know what he's supposed to be looking for, but ends up finding it. And that's the other challenge. That's also the other freedom. You want to step out of being a police procedural, which really doesn't give you a lot of room to operate. There are parameters that a police investigation has to follow. Don't pay any attention to what you see on TV. Unless it's a murder documentary, don't pay any attention to it. Because crime scene investigators do not interrogate suspects. They do not interrogate witnesses. They take pictures, 
They look for fingerprints. They look for blood spatter. They look for evidence. That's it. They don't carry guns. They don't carry badges. Nothing. Just themselves. They don't do all the law enforcement detective stuff. It's only on television. So, you know, police procedurals, you don't have a lot of leeway. So you get the amateur detective. Yeah, you got a lot of leeway, theoretically. But you can only suspend belief for so long. You still have to stay grounded in reality. When you're sitting down and you're writing out your book and you're planning the story, you got to determine early on, before you put pen to paper, am I going to have a puzzle spread out on the table with a box for them to go by? Or am I going to dump a bunch of cornflakes out and expect them to make a rooster?